Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. It was hard for me, too. Um, my name is Charles. I'm a photographer at, oh, at MIA at Minneapolis Institute of Art. And this is Kurt Nordwell. He's our master frame builder. And he builds uh, real frames, not like the frames that you'll see here, but real reproduction frames for the paintings in our collection. And um, Mia has an encyclopedic collection from uh, you know ancient Egyptian stuff all the way up to contemporary, and so we have lots of different things to do. And I hope all of you were at the party on Thursday night and you got to walk around and, okay, good, good. Um, so this is the project we did um, about a year ago, the, um, the Mia birthday, 100th birth, birthday committee came to Kurt and said, could you build reproduction frames for, or can we make reproduction artworks to put out in the world uh, before January? And Kurt said, that's crazy. And then he came to me and he said, could we do that thing where we scan the stuff and make the stuff at the makerspace? Because we had been working with, um, we had done some other projects with a local makerspace, um, but more about 3D printing and, but. I knew that those guys had this kind of capability. So we talked about it some more and realized that we could make 3D scans of, um, of the frames in the galleries. Like here's the frame in the gallery, and there's the, uh, there's the reproduction. We can make uh, 3D scans of the frames in the galleries, just one uh, section of the frame at a time, and we could, is it gonna run? That's a GIF, so I guess I should have tested that. Um, Oh, that's a gif. Um, so we made the scans in the gallery, took them to the, well, I, there's more right here. Hold on. And, and we didn't figure out where, uh, where Kurt is going to talk in this part, too. Um, I took all the, uh, and we were doing simple photogrammetry. So we, um, we went in, this was a year ago, mind you. So we went and scanned all of these objects just with our really simple, like one, two, three to catch um, photogrammetry stuff. And we uh, took the scans, and at the same time that Kurt was assembling these, um, these frames from uh, I'm sorry, the, the blocks of the frames? The, the blocks are uh, basswood, and it's a simple, very soft hardwood that with a tight grain, so that would work good on the uh, CNC machine. So this is, I'm just gluing up chunks of wood. That's... Can you guys, can you guys talk into the mics? Because it's yeah. recorded. Yeah. So sure, I can talk into the mic. Put that picture up there. There you am. Cut, cutting out the, the basic uh, fr uh, frame out of a, ply a piece of plywood, a sheet of plywood, um, just a square, cutting a, basically a mat out of a piece of plywood. And on top of, on top of that goes the, uh, b the blocks of basswood, and that will be transferred to the maker space. Go ahead. So it's there just a big block of wood glued to the, glued to the mat-like plywood that's sent out to the maker space. Go on to the next one. There's the skin. Now that's the part that I don't know about. But. <laughs> All right, so now we're back on track. I got a, ahead of my slides. Um, so we've taken these really simple scans out of a free photogrammetry program and um, taken just these chunks, and I sent them over to our guy at the maker space, and he put them on the CNC machine. And so this is the full-size frame on the CNC machine, which is a computer-controlled router that moves in three dimensions. So you load in your um, three-dimensional object and tell it you know, that this thing is 50-odd inches long, and it goes in and it carves, the, um, it, carves out, uh, it carves away all the wood. And so down here, you can see the, the edges of the frame that, they're, that the router has done. It does a rough pass, hmm. then a, a cleaner pass, and then a final pass. So the, uh, I think the, the Lucretia picture frame took about 10 hours on the machine to, to do that. So it takes a while. But to try and to have me carve all that would have taken months as opposed to hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's the dog that was with us at the makerspace. <laughs> That's Hannah. 
And this is uh, Mike Roth, who is from uh, Nordy's Makers, who we contracted with to do the work. Then we got the frames back from Micah, and Kurt put first a coat of kills on to seal them up. Well, not that we use that on regular frames. Yeah. <laughs> what I did was my. I got a raw frame that was just basswood that was very rough and I had to make that look like what you see there. Um, so basically what I did was cover it with a coating of shellac, uh, a white shellac, a couple coats of that just to kind of flatten everything out. And then um, then I used gold paint. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a red undercoating on there and then, then the gold paint uh, it was a really good gold paint, but it's that is not uh, gold leaf by any means. Um, so it was just a big f faking job is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> to make it look nice, to make it look, you know, presentable. Uh, I, was, I mean, this frame is not something that we would uh, put on, in our museum, on the wall in the museum, but it was perfect for what we were trying to do. And I'm sorry, I haven't talked about the art that's inside. We really uh, were excited about what we were doing with the frames and the 3D scanning and the, and the carving and everything. So the, the art inside is um, printed on canvas. It's a 30 by 20 print of one of the files that we had in our database, the biggest file that we had in our database. So we didn't actually take time to make new giant pictures from, from these, which I would have liked to have done. but. I don't think anybody knew the difference. Um, the rest of these slides are just the art out in the world. So if you guys have any other questions about it, this is at the, Diane. Yeah, Kurt, yeah. so does the mechanical routing, does that put you out of a job? <laughs> Good question. I mean, truly, uh, do you do all of your work? No, it doesn't. Okay, and why? Because I'm really good. <laughs> No, I I think it, in the in the framing industry they've been using these kinds of things uh, for since the 1850s, uh, you know, reproduction machines, you know, all the way you know from gun stocks to shoes and stuff like that. So it's it, it's the computer end of it that's new. Um, to do something like this in in framing, I th I think they do do it quite a bit. You know, if they make want to make 50 of them, but it just seemed like the perfect thing for for us to uh, to use. Well, does that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of. So it just isn't as good as what you're doing back at the shops. Well, oh, not by a long shot. Okay. Yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, if you were carving a a, a, a frame, I'd rather have f for for actually going into a museum, I'd rather have somebody from Italy who's actually carving it. But that's a lot of money, yeah. So, and that takes months. This takes hours. So for this kind of project, this was perfect for us. Okay. Yes. Speaking of money, can you say about how much it was costing for each frame to do this? <laughs> yeah, yes. I think the the. Can you repeat the, the question for the recording? How much money the the, the uh, CNC costs? Uh, well, the materials were about maybe $200 for each frame. And then my time at, at, I was just getting paid my hourly wage at the museum to build out the blocks. And then uh, Micah, Micah at the CNC Makerspace, I suppose uh, the, the Lucretia frame, which was the most complex, was about $1,500, is that right? I Some, think so. Something like he, that. Micah worked it out for us, so he gave us a couple of bids where here's the finest you know, detail that we could possibly do with like an eighth inch bit on the router and that would be a dollar fifty a square inch or, or something along those lines and here's a um, here's a quarter inch bit and it's a dollar a square a square inch and so we actually worked out how many square inches each of them were and I wanted a couple of different um, prices to take back to our people at the museum to say you know here's really good and he, he made samples for us you know that showed kind of the high res and, and the low res versions of it. Yeah. Boring. Yeah. Um, how do you track? How do you track the doppelgangers? Like, what's the what's the ID system for them? Are they tracked with a study collection or? 
they each have a sticker on the back that says this is not a work of art. They each had a label next to them. I don't know where it is in this one. Um, they each had a label next to them that said this is not a work of art. Uh, um, and that and that was uh, signed by a registrar. Okay. So and uh, security had some concerns and one of the <laughs> one of the con concerns was once these things leave the building we don't want them to come back into the building that was from security so so we brought it here uh, so we brought it here <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they were, they were f pretty pretty tight on that and um, in fact, one time the, the two of us were in the hall with one of these and we said, let's play the joke on uh, the head security guy and the, the, the Thor, the, the our, our security second in command, second in command says, don't even go there. No. Yeah, so we're not, we're not, this is not funny. <laughs> but it is funny. Damn. <laughs> No, 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 it's just because it's confusing to the guards. Because if you see this from a distance, it's like, why isn't that up on the wall? I just saw that up on the wall two hours ago, and now it's down here? What is, you know, so, I mean, you put them side by side, and you can tell, hopefully, which one is the real one. <laughs> but, you know, just to have something that is exactly the same size and shape as the real art is, they just didn't want it back. John. Can you talk a little bit oh, about we gotta go. the actual program? Um, yes, and then we better go because you need one of you needs to start at 915, right? Um, and this is our last slide. Um, Kurt sealed them up with wax in some cases and varnish in others. The, um, they sat out in the rain. They were out for two weeks at one location and two weeks at the ne next location. So they each went to two locations. And sometimes they were outside attached to a wall and they were bolted. We can see the, the, the guys that installed them were not our guys and they really um, we're sloppy about it. So, um, but this, I mean, I, I love this picture because you can see that they didn't mow the lawn around it. So it was there long enough that, that somebody mowed that lawn. Um, but it just stayed there. So there was no um, security around it. Every now and then there was a docent um, that we have pictures of the docent at the gas station and she's talking about Lucretia. So, and I don't know what people asked her. Gary. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think Diane wrote those labels. And the, the label ends with, come and see the real one in Gallery 355. You know, and I, does it say at the beginning and the end? That this this is, is not a real movie? Yeah, yeah. I think we just said it once. Yeah. I think people got it. Can you say a couple words about the reaction from the public and the sort of feedback we got on this? We got some really good press and some really good pictures of people doing double takes. And I don't think we did a long-term study about, you know, if that brought more people into the museum, but it was definitely part of this whole birthday year, you know, we're out there, we're everywhere kind of thing. So, are you ready? You wanna? All right, um, we're gonna switch over for a minute. I think Kurt and I are gonna take this thing with us because we have another panel in just a minute. Yeah. This is your Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you want to see if those work?
No, but the new dongle doesn't work. <laughs> oh, no, really? There's yeah. another one on the table right there. Yeah. The other one worked. It's just the one. Is everything right? Okay. Stop going in! Should I do it before I hang up? Call Thor. Thor. I've had that happen before, but... Does it make sense for us to just stand around there? Crowded. I'm trying to remember which slides are mine because I can't see. I know. Ah. Vicky might have to cue us. Vicky, I guess yeah. it works. You'll have to cue us on which slides are ours. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Are we out uh, of time? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Okay, we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, See if I can get close enough to this mic. I'm Vicki Portway. I'm head of digital experience at the National Air and Space Museum, Smithsonian Institution. And with me today are? I'm Sarah Banks. I'm the manager of online engagement in the digital experiences department at Air and Space. And I'm Jennifer Lavasser. I'm a curator in our space history division. You're so far away. <laughs> um, so I have to stay up here because I have to move the slides. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a project that we all worked together on that we felt was really transformative in terms of internal process. Um, it was also really fun and a really successful, uh, we think, uh, experience. So we wanted to share a little bit of that with you. Um, first, we'll give you a little bit of background, and then we have a couple of uh, things that we think worked for us that we're going to count down as tips. Uh, so. First off, just setting the scene, we realize that we're a very unique situation. We're a large museum, um, though we don't have as many resources as you might think. Um, <laughs> we have our own unique perspective. Um, and we also are, are very much an exhibition-driven museum in the sense of process. A lot of what we do centers around exhibitions. A lot of the funding we get for digital initiatives comes from exhibitions. Um, and the curatorial time often is focused on exhibitions for their public engagement uh, activities. So that's why we chose that process to talk about. Um, we also don't have a visitor evaluation program running all the time, so it's really an opportunistic thing. So we're not really going to talk about how the visitors responded to this so much as the internal process that we were able to, in our opinion, transform. Um, these are some of the ways that we think forward about where we want our process to go. Um, you know, in the past, we've really focused around exhibitions, and, and as a result, they've become sort of siloed in their development path and thinking. And we really want to move toward a more visitor journey focused approach where everything, you know, is a little bit more seamless for the visitor. Um, this physical on site focus with a lot of things we do, often, uh, you know, the digital experience is an add on at the end, and it doesn't always consider the folks who may not ever come to the museum. So we're really trying to think beyond the walls. We have a new vision that points to that. Um, making the museum an experience, not a building. Um, we've also been very script driven. That's basically the process. The script is written and everything flows from that. And now we're trying to really focus on stories and how we can reamplify those in various contexts. Um, online exhibitions are, are fairly siloed and we're completely breaking that apart with a new content strategy right now and looking at more ways to connect content between exhibitions and personalize the experience for visitors. And then um, I already mentioned add-on, but in terms of the process, we really want to see digital experience become something that is thought about at the conceptual stage and not later in the process. Uh, and then, of course, I already mentioned evaluation. And all these things are great, and we feel like uh, a lot of folks have already gotten on board with this. You know, we have a lot of things moving in the right direction in terms of people's thinking. The big stumbling block that we run into is that we have these traditional processes in place that still need to move forward and, and reflect this new thinking. So the vision doesn't always meet, match the process. And it's not so much why we want to do these things, it's how. We need to think about how we can do these things. So in this new project, we were able to do a couple of things that we hadn't done before. And it actually helped us think about how we can do uh, this process better. So Jennifer. So uh, Outside the Spacecraft was our anniversary exhibition for 50 years of spacewalking. Um, I was given, handed the project in mid-2013, and after a short maternity leave um, and government shutdown, I was able to come back to the project and raise funds. Basically, we had one year in which to raise funds, build the exhibition, and deal with all of our um, you know, associated things that we wanted to do. 
the exhibition um, in the window in which we had the available space could only last five months from January to June. But that encompassed the two anniversaries we were trying to hit in 2015, um, which occurred in March and June. Um, it was, of course, a short timeline, a small budget. The um, budget, our, our, our hopeful budget that we were aiming for was $100,000, which we actually managed to hit thanks to some very um, good connections that we had. And um, I knew as a curator that it was important to, to make this a lasting experience. I didn't want it, I didn't want to put all this energy into something that was just going to disappear after five months. And so my first inclination being a participant in, in creating a digital engagement strategy in cooperation with Vicki and others in the museum was to find a way to make this live on. And so I knew the right way to do that was to create something dynamic and interesting, having something that was creative that would live on on the web or other places. And also engage with this community that we deal with on a daily basis, our very active, engaged space community, um, a space enthusiast community, who would come back to this and see it as a resource. Right. And lots of people are interested in this subject matter, and we knew that going in. Uh, the top question is really, how do you go to the bathroom in space? But the second question is, what is it like to do a <laughs> spacewalk? So, so I had been developing the script. I mean, of course, there was going to be a physical exhibition, and I had to have some kind of a framework. And in the context of our museum, we work very much on a technology-focused um, you know, development of technology, story, and narrative. And so I wrote the script to basically encompass this um, question that Vicky raised, the issue we get of what is it like to be in space. So what does it take to be, uh, to be outside the spacecraft and go on a spacewalk? And so it required um, the personal spacecraft, the spacesuit, and tools in order to make that a, a, a very um, smooth experience and something that was useful. Um, but for the online exhibition, I knew that ne wasn't necessarily going to work. And I wish I had a picture of the hour-long session that we spent literally shuffling my script into different things because I didn't necessarily have the right answer. And I, as a curator, I'm willing to acknowledge I don't always have the right answers for the visitor experience. And so I depended on my team to present ideas to me that would allow me to basically take my script and shuffle it into new sets of information. The same information just figured in a different way. And so what we landed on was literally this sort of historical arc of spacewalks. And so I can't remember. Sorry, we start floating. out with floating. And so it really goes through the sort of experiences of spacewalking as it becomes um, easier to do. And so floating is this initial stage of just sort of awe and wonder. Then there's walking, so this is where we engage with the stories of walking on the moon, which is obviously a huge part of what we do at the museum. And then working really engages with the sort of later period and more recent period of um, shuttle and station. And imagining, we have a great art collection, and we didn't. this was in our art gallery, and I didn't want to lose out on giving people that experience of seeing the art and realizing that space isn't just about people going there and doing it. It's about us imagining and trying to feel like we're part of it. And so we wanted to retain that portion in particular in a different way, and that's where we also got to be a little bit more experimental in what we were doing in this particular project. And representing this, the content in a more emotional way with these words, floating, walking, working, imagining is much more personal. Um, so we, we looked at um, some different things we could do with visitor engagement uh, for this exhibit. And uh, we, there was a spot in the exhibit where it was a natural place for a selfie wall. And our visitors are naturally taking pictures of themselves in the space. So it was a way of really inviting them to do that in a more active way. Uh, we had a social, which is some of you might be familiar with tweet ups, it's, uh, but we've expanded that concept of inviting our followers, our active, passionate, engaged followers to come on, on site for a sp special you know, behind the scenes experience. Uh, we leveraged the tradition of people creating artwork from spacewalk photography and did a Tumblr project that crowdsourced original artwork from our online community. And we also did some evening events. Uh, and probably one of the most kind of fun, transformative moments uh, in this was we had an astronaut come to the social. And he was kind of skeptical about that form of visitor engagement. Uh, but seeing people reflecting his experience 
back to their followers, uh, sharing that online. He really became a convert and was very supportive of what we were doing on social media with that exhibit. And as the astronaut with the most space walking time in history, at least <laughs> as an American, it was really great to have him completely support and later tell me how great it was that we created a hashtag that he could use throughout the entire anniversary period. And he was very faithful to yeah. that. And we appreciated that. And I think he really learned what we were interested in. And, and, and it's kind of, he developed his own community of followers along with us developing ours at the same time. Yeah. And I just wanted to note that the incorporation of the artwork into the exhibition gave us an opportunity to engage an audience that you wouldn't always think of for Aaron yeah. Space and have this art activity and try and get folks who do artwork um, interested. Um, one other thing that we thought a lot about was, you know, we're creating these experiences. We really don't believe in this digital physical myth, you know, that audiences are one or the other. They just use these tools in different contexts to interact with our subject matter. Um, and so for the very first time, we had hashtags and URLs on signage in the galleries. Believe it or not, that was like a major coup. And of course, the designer, being on such a really great team that really mm -hmm. thought digital was important, um, he was like, oh yeah, we need to put those in there. And so um, now it's a thing. We're, we're doing this all over the place. So um, highly encourage that happening. Uh, you know, we realized um, with this display, we had this glove display, that this was an opportunity to provide <laughs> supplemental content that wasn't really just, you know, oh, a bucket of content that we can throw online. It was actually an opportunity to get people more engaged in looking at these gloves and learning about them. And we didn't really have space to cover that in the gallery, so we and made this little interactive 360. Yeah. I would have been a very unwise curator to try to label every single one of those gloves and tell you all the really <laughs> cool things, because the glove is the most important part of the suit because the, uh, they're constantly used. And so we wanted to go through this sort of design story, and I knew we couldn't tell all of those sort of uh, nuances of different designs without having that content somewhere and we said hey we've got to put it somewhere I think people are going to find it interesting why don't we do this and so we put a lot of effort into making something that is actually a great resource going forward it's again one of those things that we knew could live on after this mm -hmm. because people can still go and use this this could be reused in another exhibition mm -hmm. another online exhibition and it really lets people delve down into the very nitty-gritty about each of those things in a they way they couldn't in a physical gallery yeah they can examine it closer they can flip it over things they couldn't do in the physical space. Um, so this was really important. Also, we did this beautiful Parallax website, which we hadn't tried that before, and that was kind of a new thing, but it, it really reflected the visual nature of this exhibition and the idea of what is it like to be in space, so I highly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we had to have to give up some things. Yeah, I, I will say one of the hardest things we had to do in, in thinking about how we wanted to spend our money was we wanted to do something cool and different, um, and we thought an app would be the right way to go. And we spent, um, we had, we knew we were kind of reaching a time limit when we could make that decision. And it was really kind of heart wrenching to give up on this idea we had of an MMU yourself. So the MMU is this sort of backpack, jet pack, very gravity, or, you know, the movie Gravity kind of highlights the MMU in a great way. We thought it'd be very timely for people to be able to put their picture in that face. And it just, we could not have possibly, um, done that at the time and so we gave it up but I think what we got in return is actually far more beneficial. Cool. And we also had to give up inter uh, interviews with astronauts, but we were able to leverage that funding to do um, be behind the scenes videos, which was something we hadn't done before, and that turned out to be very popular. So we only have two minutes actually to go through <laughs> all these transformational tips, um, what we're calling transformational tips. So we're just going to fly through these, and you can read the slides later. Um, <laughs> sorry, so T minus eight, put yourself in the audience's shoes. Uh, we found that sharing examples of audience conversations really got everybody talking. Luckily, Jennifer was already on Twitter, and she knew what the conversations were. We've also done some informal training sessions to help people put themselves in the audience's shoes and think about how they can do their content. Uh, find small opportunities to innovate. Um, this was a small win for us in terms of being able to test small little things and see how they worked um, and see how it adapted our process internally. And it really did have an impact. I can't continue on it because we got to move through these. Um, Leverage the existing process. Don't go rogue. Uh, very important. A lot of people think that flying under the radar is the way to go with some of these um, incorporating digital into processes, but actually it's best to work within the process and just convince people along the way. And um, in this case, there was a lot of that with other folks outside the team, um, and we've seen it in other team processes. Um, focus on experience, not digital. Again, this word digital, right, that we all use all the time and, and it's completely misunderstood. Um, but you want to include it from the beginning. Um, that worked very well in this case, as Jennifer already pointed out in several instances. Um, demonstrate how the stories can be told in different ways. And um, making those decisions up front allows you to be much more agile along the way and try new stuff. 
uh, focus on stories, not scripts. This again is Jennifer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it just it wasn't it wasn't worth it in the online and a digital ex experience to feel like I should just make my script uh, in a digital set in a, a digital format. It, it wasn't going to offer anything new, and so focusing around stories, which we know from experience with programs in the museum, people love to hear from astronauts. They want to hear exactly what it's like because those are participants, mm -hmm. and so to focus in on that is sort of the opening to each of those sections of the online uh, the online version of the exhibition was um, key in sort of <coughs> looking at it in a different way. And in 20 seconds or less, embrace how visitors want to engage. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned this uh, already, but uh, visitors love to take pictures, so inviting them to do that, um, thinking about you know, what, what behaviors are already going on that will fit well with your experience goals for the exhibit and the content. Uh, kill some sacred cows, we already mentioned. Give up some things um, that you really, really want, but it's okay, you might get to do it again later. Um, and then collaborate and share roles and skills. Everybody had different ideas that came from anywhere and we embraced them. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, sorry we used up all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mean to, uh, but we'll be around, so ask us any questions. Uh, Want to be respectful to, there's somebody coming up next, right? Yeah. You guys next? Who's next? No one's next? <laughs> You're next, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> Apologies. Oh, thank you. Here's your dongle. <laughs> Sounds awkward. Here's your dongle. I'm going to be talking about dongles today. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So that fits. Raspberry Pi. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That is not good. While I'm setting up here, who here in the audience, raise your hand if you've worked with Raspberry Pis before? Or Raspberry's Pi? Okay. Uh, how many people have heard of Raspberry's Pi? Okay. Anybody in the room does not know what a Raspberry Pi is? I don't mean to shame anybody. I'm going to cover that. Okay. Good. Awesome. Okay, welcome everyone. For the 100th birthday of Balboa Park, uh, the San Diego Model Railroad Museum, we have about 17 museums, 26, 27 cultural institutions in Balboa Park. Uh, but for the 100th birthday of Balboa Park, the Model Railroad Museum built a, a centennial railway garden and it had scale models of the buildings in the park in 1915 with this tiny trolley that was period appropriate that was looping around them, you can see over here. Um, they, we had a pipe organ and the California Tower, a botanical garden, an ostrich farm, all sorts of really interesting things. So they, the uh, SDMRM came to my organization, Balboa Park Online Collaborative, BPOC, acronym soup, um, to add iPad quizzes that would let visitors um, take the quiz and then push a button to turn on lights and sounds and activate a fountain in the, the model, which was uh, actually a lot of fun. So here's the setup that we used. Um, we had three Raspberry Pi computers. Um, these Raspberry Pis were running a Node.js server. Node is kind of like a command line that runs JavaScript, but it can also act as a web server. Um, we had uh, four different modules in that. Uh, Express, which was serving a web page to the iPads for the quizzes. And then the iPads were talking back to the Raspberry Pis with web sockets using Socket.io. It was actually really simple. You can talk to me afterward about it. Um, and then on off was controlling the GPIO, the general purpose in and out pins that are on the Raspberry Pi that let it control electronics, and also going out the headphone jack to, to play sounds, wave files to a speaker. 
And then all of this was connected wirelessly. Balboa Park has high-speed internet and um, free high-speed internet. And so we had set up a private sub-network of that uh, Wi-Fi network and connected everything to this. So we finished up about a month ahead of time and handed it off to the electronics guru to wire these things up to the models. And we were thinking, this is great. We were really proud of ourselves. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and uh, three days before the uh, exhibit was supposed to, or the, insta the gallery, sorry, the garden was supposed to open, uh, everything was going wrong. So what was going wrong? Uh, first of all, the Raspberry Pis, after about 12 hours, were dropping off the network. You leave them overnight, and they were just not going on the network. And we had to take an uh, Ethernet cable and go connect to them individually and try to reset them and turn them back on again. On top of that, the, sometimes the, the node server was not playing sounds, or it was just crashing and then not running at all. And so we had to figure that out. Um, the, the electronics, the relays, relays are physical switches that were being turned on and off and that were controlling the, the fountain and the lights. Um, sometimes they weren't triggering. Was this a software problem or a hardware problem? And then on top of all of this, the iPads were sometimes getting sluggish or not really connecting at all, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. So obviously, none of this is really good. You don't want any of this happening in a project. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to try to distill 10 takeaways that we found from this that can hopefully help you on your Raspberry Pi projects. Um, especially if you're new to Raspberry Pi, hopefully these will be helpful. A lot of them will probably seem like common sense, but sometimes common sense bears repeating. <laughs> um, First of all, make sure that you test long-term and on-site. We did not test long-term. We were testing for just a few hours in our office. And there are certain problems that you only see when you test for long periods of time. The other thing is that we were testing in our office, where the Wi-Fi was perfect, all the conditions were wonderful, everything was great. When we went to the, the site, we actually held up our cell phones because we figured that they had the same kind of Wi-Fi antennas. And we were getting about four bars in Wi-Fi. So everything was going to be perfect and copacetic. No, no. <laughs> so make sure that you uh, try to test long-term and on-site. And one thing that's really helpful for this is log your error messages. Pipe your process into a log file when it's instantiated. And I can explain what that means if you're confused by that terminology after. Uh, second of all, if you're wireless, try going wired. Um, we had four big problems with the wireless. First of all, the Raspberry Pi USB Wi-Fi dongles. They're these tiny little plugs that plug into the USB. Um, they're tiny antennas. And they make bigger antennas, but we figured that the tiny antennas would work because they seem to work. And uh, test a lot in your situation to find out if you need more wireless. Um, the second thing was that there was a flag in the Raspberry Pi network configuration and in many of these computers' network configurations that allows a power-saving mode. And it says, hey, if the Raspberry Pi isn't doing anything for a long period of time, it's okay to just sleep the Wi-Fi. That's usually turned off by default, but it's a, a possible culprit. Another thing is that the, um, the garden was located right on the edge of an access point. It was behind two buildings on the edge of the park. Um, just kind of consider a back alley of Balboa Park, and that's where this was. And so when you're on a big network that has multiple access points, sometimes Wi-Fi devices will try to switch between access points. And so there are some times where there might be interference from people. Uh, human bodies can cause interference in Wi-Fi networks. And so any kind of minor interruption in the Wi-Fi network was causing it to just kind of flip and try to find another access point or jump to a different access point, and then it was just losing that connection entirely. Um, and last but not least, the iPads. Wi-Fi was the culprit with the iPads because they were uh, connecting to the Balboa Park Wi-Fi and not to the private subnetwork. And so make sure that you forget the networks that you don't need if you're using Wi-Fi. Um, but overall, uh, out of all of this, we just decided to go wired. And so we hooked all of these up via Ethernet to somebody's spare uh, wireless router, set up a private non-internet uh, Wi-Fi network and connected the iPads to that and set static IPs so that everything, there's no chance of something automatically connecting and trying to be competing for the same IP address on the network. 
But it's tough to test all of this stuff when you don't have a Raspberry Pi on hand. And as I said, about a month before this launch, we were all happy. We handed all this stuff off to the electronics guru to wire it up. These are his photos when he was hooking things up to the model and setting up enclosures for them. Um, you need to have spares on hand. And I know that you're probably running on super low budgets, but these devices are only $35 or less. And so buy a couple spares, buy some spares of the equipment so that you can keep on testing even while this stuff is being set up. Make it uniform. This is one thing that we did well is that we set up the disk image for every Raspberry Pi. The hard drive of a Raspberry Pi is an SD card. It's actually a micro SD card which fits into an SD card adapter to go into your computer, blah, blah, blah. Um, but anyway, we set up every hard drive image of the Raspberry Pis uh, exactly the same. They all had the same sounds, they all had the same files, they all had the same scripts. And this meant that if anything went wrong, and Raspberry Pis are kind of testy, unlike Arduinos, if you unplug and plug a Raspberry Pi from power without shutting it down properly, it's like a computer, and the disk can get corrupted, and we had that happen at least one time. So uh, it's really easy to just burn a new copy to another SD card and put it into the machine. How are we able to do this, though, if all the code was the same, is to write code write your scripts so that they take parameters. And what we did here is our node server script took parameters when we in invoked it that told it which of the models that was controlling and uh, certain things like how long it was supposed to run uh, the lights or the fountain. Um, and then the little ampersand is something that we learned it means to run the process in the background. There's a lot of stuff that you have to learn, just the basics of Linux about, but we'll get to that on number seven. So, <laughs> talking about the Node server, um, Node runs, has different functionalities by bringing in what are called Node modules. And these Node modules, you can go to this site, uh, or this um, thing called the Node Package Manager, with, which lets you import all of these modules, and then it'll bring in all the dependencies so that you have everything, just this nice little package. There are three Node packages on Raspberry Pi for playing sounds through the headphone jack. And we went with one, and it turned out that this was what was causing the crashes on the node server. And so we looked at that, we tested the other two, we spent basically a whole day trying all of them out, and none of them worked really satisfactorily. And what we ended up having to do is we went to GitHub, and you can see the comments on GitHub here. Um, this is for the, the Play library, which actually turned out to be the best. They had fixed the bugs on GitHub, but they had not pushed the bug, the bug fixes to the node package manager. So you had to compile, the recompile the library on your own um, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I've got a copy of that. If anybody runs into this and they need that on their project, I can send it to you. But um, there's some increasingly frantic comments over here on GitHub that are saying, please push it to NPM. I need it for my project now. It's been three months. Mm -hmm. And speaking of multiple ways of doing things, uh, we talked about multiple ways of doing things on a node server. There's multiple ways to even uh, set up a startup script, everything like uh, an RC local file, setting up a cron tab. Uh, there's tons of ways to get things to happen on startup. But if you don't know what you're looking for, uh, the, the biggest problem is knowing what the search term is. So you have to search a lot to find the search term to know what to search for. Yes. Um, learning a little bit about Linux and the command line, especially uh, Debian Linux. Uh, Code Academy actually just started a command line tutorial uh, activity. I haven't tried it out, but their other tutorials are excellent. Highly recommend checking that out. And so after all of this, we have all the software kinks figured out, we think, and the fountain is still not starting and stopping. It's, it's hooked up to the relay. We can see the log. Everything seems to be working fine. We can hear the relay. The physical switch actually makes a fi uh, an audible click when it clicks into place. And we could hear that clicking. And we're like, what is going on? Is this a software issue? Is this a hardware issue? It sounds like it's not a software issue because we can hear things working. So we called in Duncan, who is the electronics guru that was working with the Model Railroad Museum, and he tested all of the connections with the multimeter. It turned out that these wooden enclosures that we had put them in, when we opened and closed them a lot, we made one of the wires loose. So with a few literal turns of the screw, we had everything back in action. So again, work with really good experts who know how to solve the problems when you are freaking out. Nine, design for easy access. We. Um, 
you want to make sure that uh, you guys work in exhibits and in museums, and so you know that you need to think about maintenance from the beginning. But make sure that everything on your Raspberry Pi is accessible, that the USB plugs are not obscure or obstructed by something in the way, that you can plug in something into the Ethernet cable, that you can swap out the uh, micro SD card without having to unscrew it from the case. Um, and also, you want to have easy access to the area that you're supposed to be in. Um, if you notice where I'm sitting in that picture, that is where the Raspberry Pis were. I have funny stories. Ask me about it afterward. <laughs> and finally, write good documentation. I highly recommend using Google Documents or, or Hackpad or something collaborative where multiple people can contribute to it and you can keep it as a living document and add to things as you go. I also recommend trying to consider the person who's going to be reading the documentation. And so we had an entire section on troubleshooting where we asked all the questions that we wish we had answers to as we were troubleshooting them throughout. Like, oh no, the iPads are completely sluggish. What do I do? Have you checked this? Have you checked this? Have you turned on your computer? So these are all the takeaways. Um, test long term and on site. Opt for wired over wireless. Always purchase spares. Make it uniform. Make, write code that takes parameters. Test multiple options and always have a plan B. Learn the search terms. Work closely with other experts. Design for your easy access and write good documentation. Thank you very much. I, there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to get into on how to set up a Raspberry Pi. I'm putting together a one pager at the address and QR code that's up on the slide um, that will kind of walk you through, hey, I'm just starting a Raspberry Pi project. How do I save myself a lot of heartache? Um, and I'll get that up hopefully in the next couple of days. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Um, the question was, how long is the project going to be installed? And uh, I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's a new permanent exhibit because it's in the back of the museum. So if you ever come out to San Diego, it's really nifty. The Model Railroad Museum is underneath two other museums. It's kind of underground a little bit. And it's got these amazing giant landscapes uh, with trains running underneath it. It's amazing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Rebecca Sherman. I'm with Blue Cadet. We're a digital agency in Philadelphia. Thanks for coming. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about an iPad app that we made for kids. So in summary, it's an iPad app and a game. And the target age range is 9 to 11. Our client was the John F. Kennedy Library and Museum. And it launched on President's Day of this year. So quick summary, there's basically two chapters to this project, each of which is a mission. One of them is the Peace Corps, and one of them is the Space Race. These are two of the pillars of the John F. Kennedy presidency. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. So a bit of background. You may know Caroline Kennedy. She's Kennedy's daughter. She's also the honorary president and chair of the museum and a very prominent political figure. And you probably also are familiar with Disney, which is a multinational media conglomerate. Um, who also does charitable giving. So Caroline and Disney got together at a cocktail party and they came up with a really great idea. Let's make a fun app for kids. Um, so that was basically the extent of the mandate for our client and for us as we entered this project. So we received an RFP for doing a mobile app and the first thing we did was reach out to a children's educational media consultant. And the first thing she did was actually go straight into the classroom. Um, and she talked to kids just to find out what they know about JFK, what they want to know, and to give us some ideas to develop an initial concept. So our initial concept was the idea that JFK has a mission for you. And using the mobile phone as a medium, we were experimenting with, oh, maybe President Kennedy can call you, talk to you in his Boston accent, um, and send you on a mission to the moon. So once we actually started the project, this is what the team looked like. From the Blue Cadet side, we had our creative director, our consultant, um, our designer, animator, two developers, a producer and strategist, which was me, and our project manager. 
And then on the museum side, we had their executive director, director of education and programs, director of communications, and digital strategist. So this is sort of what our process looked like for this project. Um, you guys are probably familiar with these phases, and what I tried to do here is just sort of illustrate a lot of overlaps. Um, so you can see discovery moving into research and content development, um, and that's overlapping a lot with concept design. Concept design is just figuring out the idea and the approach, which overlaps a lot with then interface design and animation, a lot of back and forth there between development and QA, usability testing, of course, overlapping that and design, and then moving on to marketing and launch. So a quick recap of some of the discovery. Uh, we had a few basic objectives from our client, which was to reach a younger demographic. 80% of the country was not alive when JFK president. Um, that probably includes a lot of you guys sitting here. Um, it includes everyone actually who works for Blue Cadet. Um, so <laughs> um, it's, I mean, you know, 60s. Um, so it, it's really important for the, to the library actually to move to a new generation who doesn't have a living memory of JFK. Um, on top of that, they really wanted to be fun and not too academic, but to still teach a civic lesson. Um, and then to reach beyond their local market, and in order to do that, have a standalone product that was independent of the museum experience. These are basically the five pillars of JFK's legacy that the museum aims to teach. And our mandate was to try to teach some, if not all, of these pillars through the app. Public service, volunteerism, innovation, responsible citizenship, and diplomacy. So I'm going to walk you through quickly some of our initial research and concept design work. First, what we did is we just started looking into some of these topics with, with some of our initial game ideas. Um, so we actually dug through the Peace Corps archive to find some original material. And the, the first year of Peace Corps was 1961, and they actually have images on their website um, from the initial articles and journal entries of the initial class of the Peace Corps. So it, the app is actually historically accurate to which countries they went to and what activities they did in those countries. And we did some research into the local language and culture of the different countries we were considering including. Um, I'm not a designer. This was my very, very rough sketch that I gave to our creative team with some really early gameplay ideas. Um, and you'll see a little bit of this later, but just showing you some of our process. And once we had an, a, original, an initial idea of our concept, we move on to interface design and animation. So part of the process is looking at, OK, how do all the different pieces of the game fit together? And creating a flow chart, importantly for our team and for our client team and for our developers to understand, well, what is the big picture of this game? And how is the user going to throw th flow through all these different levels? You can see this is also paired with some wireframes um, so that you can refer back to some visual schematic ideas of the mock-up, but also look at the big picture. And we actually continued to use this as we were getting more and more into interface design. So the ones that you see here that are in color are uh, you know, des design round one, other ones are wireframes, and we continued to make sure that we understood the, the way that all of the pieces fit together. We also included three original animations into the game, which provide historical context. And this is a storyboard of one of the early, very concept development of the animation, which I'll show you guys. So moving on, now I'm just going to recap the product a little bit. Here's just a short video showing some of the gameplay and the overall aesthetic and feel of the app. So this is just showing a space race mission. So you have now a sense of some of these activities that I'm going to sort of walk you through how we arrived at them. Um, so one of the first things that we really focused on was designing for the device. Um, we ultimately selected an iPad. Our research showed us that the target age range actually had a lot more access to an iPad, both at home in the class and in the classroom, than they did to a mobile phone, which is why we switched to the iPad as the device. Um, so what we wanted to do is, OK, we're using this great device. Let's really take advantage of what the device has to offer. Um, so the first thing that the iPad has, which is really great, is a camera. Um, so we included a little bit of personalization into the game um, to really get the kids to feel like they're part of this mission that the president is sending them on. And we introduced these images as fun little Easter eggs throughout the game to sort of remind kids, OK, this is you on this mission. You're part of this experience. 
Next, you saw in the video that the kids were actually tilting the iPad to do some of the steering activities flying to the moon, um, even though technically they didn't have to steer the spacecraft, the spacecraft to the moon. So a little inaccuracy there, but um, we wanted to take advantage of the accelerometer. And so a few of our games use the accelerometer. The next is drag. Um, so basically, touch devices, the Apple touch devices and other tablets, um, smartphones and tablets, basically have three modes of touch, which is a simple touch, a swipe, and a drag. And we incorporated all of these different touches into various points of the gameplay. So this particular, particular game you see here is from the, space, um, the Peace Corps mission, where we're doing a little geography lesson um, based on the original countries of the 1961 inaugural class of the Peace Corps. And the students have to actually drag the plane to the different countries to learn geography. It's actually harder than you would think. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is incorporating game dynamics into the game. Um, one of the game dynamics we use is to have upcoming levels locked. So this really encourages kids to repeat play on the levels and learn and improve their performance until they're actually able to beat each level. And this creates motivation to actually go through the entire game. Another thing that we use is a points and reward system. So we both have stars as well as numerical points to give kids feedback on their performance. And again, recourage in um, repeat gameplay. Um, and also to provide ongoing incentive and rewards so that there's both an immediate gratification as well as a delayed gratification. Another thing that we did was limited time to complete some of the challenges. Um, so you can see here on this game, the overall challenge has a time at the top, um, which is three minutes to complete the game. In this particular activity, um, you're creating cement blocks to build the village in Colombia, to build buildings in this village in Colombia where you're doing your Peace Corps mission. Um, so you actually have different timed features throughout the game as well as the level overall. The last game dynamic we used was personalization, which I talked about a little bit with the camera. And again, incorporating the personalization over and over throughout some of these mini games provided those continual rewards for the users. So the next thing I want to talk about is some gameplay conventions. And the first one we did is a simple matching. Um, this is a Spanish lesson. And we wanted to reinforce the idea that in order to be in the Peace Corps, there's a lot of training involved, and you have to learn about the local culture. Um, so this is a simple matching game where you have to drag the image to the correct Spanish word. And then you actually have to use those Spanish words later in another mission in order to complete it successfully. The next is building, which you saw earlier. Um, so this is a gameplay convention that a lot of kids are familiar with through different apps. And they're able to learn the particular, particular building process in this game. We also had a maze game. Um, so here you're in your village in Colombia, and you're digging um, a trough to bring water to your village. And this maze is actually code generated, code generated to be different every time you play the game. So again, repeat gameplay can be interesting and rewarding. And there's three different levels of the maze that increase in difficulty. And finally, there's free exploration. Um, in our case, we chose a treasure hunt. So at the end of each mission, your reward is you get a large illustrated scene. One is of the surface of the moon, and the other is of the Colombian village to explore. And there's hidden um, historical artifacts and fast facts and other fun things to find in free play exploration. So very importantly, we wanted to look at how can we weave history and context in to make sure that those educational goals are being met. And one of the ways, as I mentioned, was you know the, the museum has this amazing collection of hi historical images. Um, so this is a lunar lander. And you saw we had a game based on landing the lunar lander, but also incorporating those actual historic photographs into the game is really important to provide context. The other thing that we did, as I mentioned, was we created three custom animations one for the game overall and about JFK, and one for each of the two missions to really provide some historical context. And I'll show you a short clip of one. This was the one where I showed um, the storyboards of earlier. The year was 1961. After the successful flight of the first American in space, President Kennedy challenges the nation to explore the frontiers of the universe. Sorry, the audience. I believe that. that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. President Kennedy. So each of the animations is about a minute and a half. So finally, we worked on a lot of marketing efforts. So I'm going to show you a little bit about our marketing and results. 
Um, so the client had a pretty comprehensive marketing campaign that we worked really collaboratively with them on. It included social, me social media marketing, PR, direct <laughs> outreach, um, print, flyers, live events. Um, and just two examples here on the left is a microsite, a promotional microsite we developed, which is really important to have when you're releasing an app. So you can actually send people to this microsite to drive excitement before the app launches. And basically, it's a promo and preview of the app. Um, and having that URL is really handy when you're doing marketing. And then you can see they also had some ads placed around the city that they were actually able to get uh, placed for free. Um, most importantly, they were able to cultivate a relationship with Apple. Um, and this is something that Apple is actually very eager to cultivate relationships with museums to find great content um, to help them sell their products. Um, so they actually have relationship managers who focus solely on the museum sector who are looking for this great content to promote. And they worked with us. They gave us some tips on improving the app. Um, and on President's Day, they actually featured it as a banner in the iTunes store. So as a result, um, the app was very successful in terms of number of downloads, and it re reached um, the number two spot under free apps for kids 9 to 11. And we got some great reviews. So as you can see, the vast majority of reviews are five star. Um, there were a f handful of conspiracy theorists who did give us a one star review based on <laughs> some conspiracies about JFK. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of funny. <laughs> Um, and also, they reached out directly to prominent blogs and reviewers to actually have the app reviewed and featured, and we got some great feedback from those folks. So in total, in the last 10 months, the app has received 112,000 downloads, um, so, and many of them are from around the country as well as around the world. So looking back to some of those clients' original objectives and goals, um, so far we're reaching a broad audience. And I'm just going to give you guys a quick recap of some of the things I talked about and tips for developing an iPad game. Um, so get to know the audience. Again, we weren't experts in designing for children or in childhood development. So we brought an outside expert who has a background from Sesame Street and from Sprout to teach us about this age group and to actually work directly with them. Um, we also make sure to take advantage of the device capabilities to employ gameplay dynamics, to utilize gameplay conventions, <laughs> and to weave educational content into the experience throughout, and then finally a multifaceted marketing plan. So that's it, and uh, I know you guys have a coffee break right now, but I would love to take questions. Yes? Was there a problem with the Sure, um, I'd be happy to talk about that. So the original grant was for 85,000. Um, the final budget for the app itself ended up being around about 100,000, and the investment of uh, labor that Blue Cadet made into the project was around 250000 <laughs> um, And the project took, pff, let's see, I would say, that's my 15 minutes. I would say it took um, just about a year from start to finish. Other questions? Um, so we did usability testing both on site in our studio as well as um, the client did it in the museum um, on the floor. So for our on site testing, we actually recruited kids via social media. Um, we gave them $20 cash and we re video recorded all of the testing. Um, and we also had our designers and developers in the room observing. Um, and then afterwards, we went through the key takeaways. The main finding was basically that reading comprehension was the biggest problem that we were running into, um, especially with the game instructions. And we ended up incorporating more graphics and GIFs, basically illustrating the gameplay at the beginning of each level. Did you do the testing before it was even on screen? Like, did it take a prototype concept testing? Um, most of our testing was done during initial development phase. Anybody else? Thanks a lot. If you guys want to check out the app, you can go to dfkchallenge.org. And um, you can hit me up on Twitter if you have more questions.